Sabaku! Man, what a great Sunday to be together. Those of you in Fremont, San Jose, Sunnyvale, Church Online, you made it. You made it to church. Are you all excited for the party today, everybody? Man, it's going to be awesome. My name is Felipe, by the way, if we haven't met. I am the lead pastor here at Echo. We are one church, multiple locations, and everybody is welcome at Echo. You might find yourself here today exploring the claims of Jesus. Uh, maybe you're just trying to deepen your faith in him. This is the place to be. I want you to know that if you're a guest, you chose a great Sunday to be here because it is our annual block party. Our experience is a little shorter inside of our auditoriums and spaces today because we're going to reserve time to go party outside. And then everybody today gets a really cool free t-shirt. Hope you're excited about that as well. So here's the deal. I want to share with you for just a few minutes today a time when Jesus seemed to have made his mama mad. I don't know if you realize this happened uh, before, but it is recorded by a man named Luke. He was a doctor that was an eyewitness uh, of the life of Jesus and wrote an account that we call the Gospels, like one of the Gospels of Jesus in the Bible. And this is about an instance where he seemed to have made mama mad. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I was one of those kids. Like, I made mama mad several times times. My brother and I knew how to poke at my mom's anger at times and emotion. Everything from like leaving the dishes out beyond what I should have and to lying and to later on even drug dealing and then burning down fields by my house that I was not supposed. Anyone else like the bad kid that made mama mad? Anyone? Come on. All of our kids, raise your hand. If you, if you knew how to make your mama mad growing up, raise your hand. Look around. A lot of bad people at Echo Church. <laughs> a lot of us. Okay, don't lie. Jesus seemed to have had this moment as well. Let me show you. This is in Luke chapter 2. And it says this, that every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And when Jesus was about 12 years old, so picture Jesus at 12 they attended the festival as usual. Now, after the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind. Now, every family seems to have this kid, by the way, that's like when it's time to go, they don't feel ready to go, or they're like, oh, I forgot my shoes, uh, or I forgot whatever, my phone, and they like always are, they're the kid that's always behind everybody else. Maybe you're that kid, I don't know, but that, that seems to be the moment Jesus is in. Like his family went back to Nazareth after the festival, and he's like, I'm not done yet in Jerusalem, so he stayed behind. Well, his parents didn't miss him at first. Because they assumed he was among other travelers. But when he did not show up that evening, so picture this, all day long, they began looking for him among their relatives and their friends. Now let me confess, have a moment of vulnerability before you hear. This is one of my biggest fears in life. It's forgetting one of my kids. I mean, I, and I have five, so my odds are pretty great to forget one of my kids. And I actually did this one time in a really bad way. Now, when my daughter, Lily, was about 12 years old, same age, I think, as Jesus right here in this moment, she wanted to go to Safeway. I was going to go drop off something at a friend's house. I was like, just come on over with me. And I had this idea. I was like, how about this? The house is right down the street from Safeway. So you go in Safeway. Uh, get your stuff. I'll meet you right out here. Take a minute. I'm going to drop off the stuff at the friend's house. Come right back, and I'll be waiting for you. So I went, dropped her off, went to my friend's house, dropped stuff off, and then he started asking me questions about stuff that he's building in his house. And I was like, oh, and we started talking 20, 25, maybe 30 minutes later, I get a phone call. Phone rings. It's a strange number. I just pick up, and it's my daughter. Dad, did you forget me? And you, you know, if you've done this, you know this moment. My heart just sank. And I was like, oh, I am the worst dad on earth. So I, I went into my car, went over to Safeway, and there is Lily crying outside of Safeway uh, because her daddy forgot her. I'm really sorry, Lily. She's right here. Um, can you give it up for my daughter, Lily? Sorry to embarrass you. But I got her permission to share this. And, and here's the thing, if you've done this before, 
you know your heart sinks. Like you, it's like a moment you forever regret. To this day, I look at her, and when I remember, I'm like, I'm sorry about that one day years ago, because you never forget the moment. Now, for context, though, of what was happening here, it, it was common for people to travel in big groups in their day. In fact, Jerusalem was like the hub of religious and social life in Israel. And so when you lived in nearby towns, everybody would go together. The whole town often would travel, like aunts and uncles and grandma and grandpa. Everybody traveled from one town to the next. So you take care of each other's kids. Now, if you're wondering the distance, I actually did this ride a couple years ago in Israel. So we took a bus from Jerusalem to Nazareth, it took about two hours in a bus ride. Let me show you the distance here on the screen. If you're walking, it takes about 20 hours or so. If you take a train, it's a couple hours. If you go by camel, it's about 20 hours. You can save a couple hours there of your life. Um, but it, it's, it's a good ride. If you're trying to figure out the distance, it's like walking from um, Morgan Hill all the way to San Francisco. That's the distance between Jerusalem and Nazareth. Now, when they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him. So imagine this walk, okay? Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among other religious leaders, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his answers and his understanding. So something was happening here that was quite significant. Now, his parents didn't know what to think. It's like if you lose your kid and you're like about to get really mad and then you find out they're in church praying. You know, you're like, how do I get mad at that child? You know, it's like an innocent heart, but it was a mistake. She says, son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. If you're a mom, you know this emotion. If you don't have kids, picture like losing your pet, or if you don't have pets, maybe your other biggest possession that you can't live without, your phone. Uh, picture losing your phone, and you're like, I don't know what to do, but this is a big moment. Now, his answer is very puzzling. Jesus says, why did you need to search? Didn't you know I must be in my father's house. Now, this, this little phrase is really puzzling. My father's house. In fact, I want you to say this phrase with me. My father's house. All campuses together. So I want you to remember this. One, two, three. My father's house. See, this weird. Like he's in the temple, which is a center of worship in their day. And mom is looking. And he's like, didn't you know? Like, I, I must be in my father's house. And then, I don't, you know, Luke makes a point to say, they didn't understand what he meant, which I think most of us would be puzzled at this moment. And then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all of the people. So here's the question. Did Jesus mess up? Did he mess up in this moment? Because if you are a parent or just a human, you would assume that if a child wants to stay behind, like common courtesy is, mom, are you okay if I stay in another city while you travel to that home, to our city? Like you, you would inform your parents a very minimum. So Jesus here just does it. And the reason this is a strange question is because to almost every religious group on earth, Jesus is considered a holy man. And in Christianity, we consider not only him a holy man, but he was fully God and fully human. So he lived a sinless life is what we teach. But could he have made mistakes growing up? See, there is a huge difference between a mistake and a sin. And the implications of our understanding of this are literally eternal. See, a mistake is an unintentional error or action or judgment caused by insufficient knowledge or reasoning. It's a child that doesn't know better. It's the moment it's like, oh, I bumped into you by accident. I'm sorry. That's a mistake. Now, a sin, though, is different. A sin is a willful violation of God's commands or moral principles. It's a deliberate choice to go against God's standards, and we all have done it. 
It's when we know it's not just me bumping into you. Now it's me punching you in the face intentionally out of anger that sin. And saying, I'm sorry, then it's just not enough. We all can understand that sin's consequences are incredibly greater than an innocent mistake. It is very possible that in this instance, Jesus made a mistake as a child. It's very possible that he was a child that had to learn things through the pain like we, all of us, had to. It's possible that he peed his pants as a baby. It's possible that maybe one day he dropped his cup and spilled it all over the table. He made a mistake. It's very possible that Jesus, when his dad was teaching him how to be a carpenter, perhaps, he missed a nail or two or did something that wasn't quite aligned. Perhaps this is why the writer of the book of Hebrews wrote it this way. He says, even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. See, he must have learned some things through the process of pain and mistakes and so forth. But we do know when he went back home, he was obedient. Once he knew, he was obedient. And we see a little glimpse of his heart in this phrase that he answered his mom with. Why did you need to search? Didn't you know I must be in my father's house? A more literal translation, in fact, if you look at your, your sub, sub notes or your little footnote of your Bible, it'll say that he literally said, didn't you know I must be about my father's house? So this idea of father's house was something he talked about quite a bit, and he was very passionate about it. He called this the temple the father's house, and he was passionate about it not because of the temple itself, it's what the temple represented. The temple represented God's desire to live inside of the human body. See, just as God told the people to build a temple with a special room for God's presence, God also built our bodies with a special place in our hearts for his presence. And until that presence is inside of us, we live with a void that we continually try to fill with everything else that will just leave us empty. Jesus cared about that void inside of each of us. He cared about your void and the void of the people around you in your life, and it consumed him. See, this is where sin plays a role. See, sin is when, when we bring in a willful violation of God's standard, when it comes into us, it then detaches God's presence from our life. It is separating us from God. And when God looks down at humanity, knowing I created you to be my temple, I don't live in temples made by human hands. The buildings of the church and the people of God don't mean much to God. The buildings are not holy. It is the people that are holy. God lives in temples built by his hands, and Jesus knew this. His ultimate desire was to come back into the human heart, but for that to happen, sin had to be solved. So he came down to earth. He took our sin, the penalty of our sin, a separation from God upon himself, was brutally murdered on a cross. And on that cross, he says, it is finished. Your sin has been dealt with. Your mistakes, they have little consequences. Your sin has eternal consequences. But if you turn from them and turn to me, Jesus says, I will give you a fresh start. I will give you eternity with God, and his presence can then live inside your body. God created a place in your heart for his presence. Did you know that? Every day you wake up, that is missing that little presence is a day that you will feel a little bit more empty. But God wants to fill that little void, that part of you that says, I need a purpose. Like there's got to be a reason why I'm on the earth. There's got to be more to life than just going to work and making money and going to sleep and going to work and making money and so forth and le living a life that is empty. And that extra, that thing that you're missing, that's the presence of God himself that Jesus came to solve. He cared about it. This is why Peter said it this way. You are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Which means when you place your faith in Jesus, there's a fresh start no matter what you've done. There's a new beginning for life. 
all your mistakes, all of your failures as parents and as individuals, as, as singles and as college students, as high school students, whatever it is you find yourself in, all of those are erased and a new beginning starts. But I want you to notice what Jesus, uh, after what Jesus said, what his mom said, or what Luke recorded was their reaction. It says they did not understand what he meant. But it says that she pondered these things or stored all these things in her heart. I want you to know that you don't have to know all the answers to take a step toward Jesus. Most people around him when he walked the earth were very puzzled at what he said. But the few that pushed through the doubt and pl placed their faith in him in spite of their doubts were completely transformed because an open heart is the foundation for God's miracles. I wonder how open your heart is today to God, to more of God. See, because Mary opened her heart, God came in. Faith, by definition, is putting your hope in something that's not quite fully understood. He's not scared of your questions and of your doubts and all of the things that seem confusing about life. What he wants is your heart. In just a few weeks, we're going to go on a journey together that you're going to hear more about called Explore God. And in this journey, we're going to wrestle with the big questions of life not only on Sundays, but in small groups. We call table groups around meals, discussing it together. I want to encourage you to join those, not only if you have questions about faith, but those of us that want to deepen our faith in Jesus, this is a journey we're going to go on together as a community. But I want you to hear the story of one person right here at Echo who came as a skeptic, completely trying to push away Jesus, but eventually opened his heart to what Jesus meant to him and watch what happened to his life. Check it out. Hello everyone. My name is James and I've been coming to Echo Church for about a year and a half now. And if you have some time, I'd love to share a story of how I was transformed from a non-believer into a prayer leader. And I kind of like that and I'm thinking about putting it on a shirt if anybody wants one. Anyway, the story begins with a simple invitation. One of my best friends, Shane, invited me on a random Sunday back in February of 2022 to come to a church that he goes to called Echo. And my first reaction was, nah, I'm okay, because at that time I would describe myself as a very skeptical person. You know, I was a very logical type person and I spent a lot of time in graduate education, sort of being ingrained and being trained in the scientific method and sort of understanding the world through that lens. And to me, religion didn't really make much sense. However, I am the curious type and so I was interested to see what Echo Church would be like. Plus, I did like the music, and Shane mentioned that the band here at Echo is really, really good. So I figured, you know what? What's the worst that's gonna happen? I get some free tea, I get to enjoy some great music, and I get to hang out with my best friend on a Sunday. You can't really beat that. Now, to my surprise, the message that was shared was not really that boring. Uh, I, I expected it to be, but it wasn't the message here at Echo actually made a little bit of sense. However, I was still super skeptical. I actually took issue with some of the things that were being said, and I had a few questions that really made me want to come back. Now, a few Sundays after, someone on stage mentioned this thing called Alpha, this group where people come together, they come to Echo, they enjoy dinner, they get to ask some big questions about life and faith and meaning. And I turned to Shane, and I was like, I'll join if you will. And I mean, come on, it's free dinner. It's a chance to ask questions, to hear other people and what they have to say about life and this thing called God. It sounded like a great opportunity to put my skepticism to some good use. But when I look back on things, there's a few things that I noticed. First, what made me wanna come back here was the community that I found here at Echo. Being surrounded by people that allowed me to ask questions, that allowed me to process the I different agree. confusions and some things that I didn't quite understand helped me to learn and grow my faith. Trust me, I had a lot of questions. I mean, a lot of questions. And it actually turns out that my curiosity and my questions are the very things that helped me to explore and grow in my faith, and also to connect with other people who were wrestling with their faith and had questions of their own. 
Now you might be wondering, you know, at what point in the story did everything change for you? And I wish I can point to like a single moment or a single experience or this dramatic thing that sort of just clicked in my, in my life. Now, one of the things I was noticing during this journey, as I was asking all of these questions, as I was going through these doubts and these criticisms about God, something was changing, right? My heart was changing. And I slowly started to shift from this perspective of doubt and criticism to approaching faith with trust in God. And I eventually got to a place where things started to connect. And trust me, it took a very, very long time. It was very, very small steps, but I truly believe God exists. I do believe Jesus did die for me and rose from the dead and that there is power in the Holy Spirit and that he is doing life with me. And sometimes I need it a lot. Now the skeptic out there listening to this might say like, uh-oh, you know, James has gone crazy. He's brainwashed, joined a cult, or that this is just some isolated story or incident or that I've abandoned all logic or scientific understanding. And to that, I would say, test it for yourself. If you call yourself a logical person or a skeptic or that scientific type person, put faith to the test. Observe all the evidence, do your homework, do your research, but be careful because you might find yourself recording a video for Echo a year later, just saying. So if you're listening to this video, keep on asking, keep on exploring, right? Matthew 7 says, if you ask, if you seek, you will find. I had no idea that my curiosity would completely change my heart and lead me down this path. And if you would have asked me if I would have been a follower of Jesus back in February of 2022, probably would have laughed in your face and explained all the reasons why you're completely wrong. So if you are skeptical, if you have questions, good. That keeps things interesting, and trust me, I think God can handle any and all questions that you have for him. I can't promise that you'll get them all answered. I can't promise it's gonna be easy, but what I can promise is you're gonna grow and you're gonna learn a lot. Plus, if you have questions, I'd love to chat with you, so come find me. James's story is quite powerful. But if you've been around the church long enough, you start to realize that that story is pretty consistent with a lot of other individuals out there. And you might be here today noticing that there's a shift in your heart. My name's Stephen. I'm the campus pastor here, and I'm going to close our time together. But my personal story is actually very similar to James. At 22 years old, I was walking through life on my own journey, trying to do things the way that I felt was best. Things didn't work out as clearly as I wanted them to, and so I began exploring the claims of Jesus. As I read the Bible, things started to illuminate a little bit. As I watched historians and documentaries, I started to understand things a little bit more, and I came to this point in my journey of exploring faith where I myself had to take a leap of faith. After exploring these claims, I realized that there was two choices. Jesus was either Lord or he was a lunatic. And whichever I decided, there was going to be eternal implications. If he was in fact Lord, but I thought that he was lunatic, and I put my faith in that, I stepped outside of his will for my life with eternal consequences. But if in fact he was Lord, and that's the way that I chose, or I chose that he was Lord, and in fact he was a lunatic, it was all a farce. But after 15 years of following Jesus, I'm here to tell you that my one decision to jump out of the boat and pursue Jesus has changed my life. I didn't have all the right answers at the beginning. And to be honest, I kind of lived halfway in the world, halfway with Jesus, until I started to work it out myself, getting plugged into community and figuring things out. But on my journey, one of the things that helped me really understand this was the difference between a mistake and sin. As Pastor Felipe said, we all like make mistakes. You bump into somebody, oh, I'm so sorry. But a sin is a willful decision to go outside of God's will or his mercies or his principles for our lives. And as I started to read the Bible more and more, I recognized that sin meant death. The early follower of Jesus, Paul, 
who was actually a hater of Jesus, who got converted after he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he writes this to the Romans. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, sin equals death, but eternal life is in Jesus. And he goes on another spot in Romans. He says, for everyone has sinned. That's you, that's you, that's you, that's you, that's you. Those of you in the warehouse, family viewing room, all of us online, we have all sinned. We have fallen short of God's glorious standards. Yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. See, God, he took Jesus and he presented him as the sacrifice for all sin, not just yours, not for the people who follow him, but for all sin. And then we are made right when we believe what Jesus did, that he sacrificed his love and he shed his blood for us. And so when this came to me at 22 years old, it made so much sense and I jumped out of the boat and made the decision. We're at the point right now where you all have to make a decision. And so we're gonna have a personal moment of reflection. And I'm just going to ask you to all close your eyes so we can all internalize this for a moment. If you're here today and you are hearing my voice and you have yet to make that decision to follow Jesus, but you feel this tug in your soul, you're kind of nervous, maybe your palms are sweating a little bit, and you feel like, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this, but I can't kind of withhold it anymore, and I think I'm supposed to jump. We want to encourage you to join us in a journey of following Jesus. And I'm gonna ask you to be bold here in just a moment to, to declare that this is a choice you're making. Today I'm committing to follow Jesus. And so when I count to three, I'm gonna ask if that's you, would you hold your hand up high and keep it held up as a sign and a declaration that you are making a decision to follow Jesus. One, your life will never be the same. Two, you are sealing your fate for eternity. Three, raise your hands. You are choosing to follow Jesus. Keep them high, keep them high, raise them high. Keep them bold. This is the best decision of your life. Yes, keep them up, keep them up. Okay, now everyone in the room, I want you to repeat this prayer with me out loud. Jesus, I need you. I turn from my sin. I choose you. Make your home inside of me. Amen. Can we celebrate for those individuals that made a decision? Woo! Some of you got the heart palpitations going. I get it. I understand. But there's another choice I'd like you all to make as well. This one involves using your phone. Would everybody go ahead and pull out your phone with me right now? As Pastor Felipe mentioned, we are gonna begin in a few short weeks a 10-week journey as a community to explore God. And so that means not just coming to a Sunday service and hearing, but that means going and gathering in community. There's something different when you sit around a table with people. And we would like for every single person that wants to know more about God, you might have been following Jesus for 20 years. I guarantee you, you don't know it all yet. I'm gonna encourage you to join a group. So right here, you'll see the QR code. This is also where we check in. So everybody scan that QR code right now. If it's your very first time here, go ahead and click the box at the top, let us know. As you fill out your information, if you raised your hand, you'll see there's a box there that says, today, today I'm committing to follow Jesus. Please check that so our team can follow up with you and send you the resources you need to take those first steps. And then everyone else can go ahead and click, I'd like to join a table group and hit submit. As you do that, our team will follow up and give you a little bit of an insight in how you can join one of the table groups that are already set up and assigned during our Explore God series that kicks off in September. And so we'd love for you to join us in that. Go ahead and do that now. 
Another key thing that we do here at Echo each and every week is we pause for a moment of generosity. Uh, We know that God gave freely to us his son, Jesus. And so we give of our resources back into the work that matters most to him and helping people in our region uh, and globally supporting the ministry so we can do things like this and share the message of Jesus. So if you'd like to join us, feel free to scan the QR there uh, and we'd love to receive some generosity from you guys to continue the mission. Uh, But in just a moment, we're gonna go out and we're gonna party. And you're all going to get a shirt that says, For the Good of the Bay. And this is an anthem that we, as a community, are leaning into. Because we believe that we, Echo Church, are here for the good of the bay. And we're going to do a five-week teaching series about what that means before we dive into Explore God. But I'd rather you hear from our Echo Compassion Director, Sarah Rogers, on what to expect. Go ahead and check out the screen from God's goodness for the good of our world. That's the purpose and calling we were given as a church. Not to be known just for our words, but by our good works. That the communities we plant and invest ourselves in would be forever changed for the good. That's our prayer for the church. And that's why we're pressing into this with our next teaching series. You'll get to hear not just from our pastors, but from city officials, CEOs in tech, innovators, nonprofit leaders, and more. Join us starting August 20th for our new teaching series and discover how you can make a difference for the good. I'm so excited to unpack all that God's doing here at the Bay uh, and how we can partner. Uh, So I wanna give you guys some of the logistical things because are you ready to party? All right, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little disappointed. Maybe I didn't set you up well enough there, okay? 10 a.m., they took two tries. 8.30 did pretty good. I think you guys can be the loudest. I wanna hear you in the warehouse. Are you ready to party? There we go, okay, all right. So, in just a moment, we're gonna release you. And as you head out into the lobby, there's gonna be tables with the shirts there. Uh, One shirt per person present, okay? Uh, If you're in between sizes, uh, I would go for the bigger sizes unless you look really good in tight muscle shirts. Uh, I took the bigger size personally. And so uh, go ahead and grab a shirt. Outside we've got food trucks, a mechanical bowl, a rock climbing wall, volleyball. There's vendors out there selling some awesome stuff. There's water slides for the kids. It's gonna be an amazing time to celebrate Uh, If it's your very first time, swing by the hub. We have a gift for you and a meal ticket to go get food on us. Uh, Just so you guys know, we've been dealing with a little bit of a bathroom issue. Uh, I think it's close to being resolved, so hopefully uh, the bathroom will be resolved. But there is a bathroom on the other side of the building as well. And if you are a student in 6th grade through 12th grade, you get to party today. But we also have a party just for you on Friday night called Hype Night right here in this room. And then we'll be kicking off for the good right back here on Sunday next week uh, for all four services. Thank you for being here. Let's go party.